Um, our first speaker, Kalani Nicole, uh, is an independent curator based at New York City. Um, she founded and runs Transfer, an experimental, open-spirited uh, gallery supporting artists with computer-based practices. Since 2013, she's worked to explore new modes of supporting and exhibited distributed artworks, namely those artworks that exist in digital, networked or virtual spaces. She's pioneered new models of collecting digital works and open sharing to champion artists and digitally based practices, as well as significant program of mixed reality commissioning. Can I invite up to the speaker now, uh, Kalani. Thank you so much. Um, also, thank you to ACME for the invitation, my first time in Melbourne. And I'm really excited to share my work with a new part of the world. So um, Transfer is an experimental exhibition space that I founded in 2013 in a warehouse in the Bushwick neighborhood of Brooklyn. I've been programming the space there now for five years, and in that time it's become an internationally recognized gallery supporting variable media in the contemporary art world. A little aside, transfer is my second life. I also work professionally in the field of technology with a specialty in user experience design, which aims to make software and digital experiences more human. For those of you who know Seb Chan, you know this practice very well. Um, so my professional skills have carried over into my work at the gallery. So I believe transfer really has developed in response to real needs that I see in the studios. At Transfer, I support a generation of artists in a very iterative and experimental kind of way. These studios function more in line with the ideals of technology culture than the rigid institutions and scarcity models of the art world. And this is a huge part of what has always motivated my work at Transfer. I feel the underlying tension around scarcity and authenticity is shifting in the art world. Artworks such as animated GIFs, for example, are meant to live online. And this kind of distributed artwork is an important movement in contemporary art. It has the potential to reshape cultural audiences and become a disruptive market force. I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. So this is my space in Brooklyn, and it transforms with every show. I present only solo exhibitions in the gallery. It allows me to really dig in with my artists one-on-one -on -one and be more responsive to their needs and ideas for the space. I don't do formal representation at transfer. Once you are a transfer artist, you're always a transfer artist, and this is a very fluid and flexible relationship. And the way transfer operates behind the scenes is much more uh, like a patron relationship than a commercial gallery model. And I also collect a work from each show, so I am truly invested in my artists. After two years of programming the space, when I was first getting started, I noticed the gender balance was slightly off. I had a few more men in my program than women. So I decided to commit a full year to doing solo shows with women who are refiguring technology. And the resulting work was so impactful the shows were so deep and emotional that I kind of just kept doing it. So um, I've made nine solos in the past two years with women and in the meantime incubated a powerful contemporary feminist movement at Transfer. Um, so now after five years I'm doing something a little different. I still maintain the space in Brooklyn, but I'm now handing my keys off to other women to curate the space, opening it up a little bit more to perspectives beyond my own. Um, and that also creates space for me to step into a new role um, with a nonprofit collecting institution, a new kind of museum called The Current, which I'll talk about at the end here today. Um, so that's just a little introduction to transfer. And now I'm going to share some characteristics of the types of studios that I represent, talk briefly about the art market from my perspective, and then share some examples in which I'm developing new programs of support and alternative ways of working with artists who have primarily software-based practices. Uh, I sometimes refer to this generation as the networked avant-garde, uh, which describes a way of working uh, another term I've been working to develop is simulism, and I've been exploring this alongside the artists that I support. And we're defining this as an emerging contemporary art movement that has developed in reaction to the ideologies of Silicon Valley, the platforming and globalization of culture, and technology of powers like artificial intelligence, photorealistic CGI, and virtual and augmented reality. Here are some characteristics of this generation. 
a lot of this will be familiar to you. I, I know already from hearing some of the other speakers, we're, we're very familiar with this type of practice. Um, so it's actively shared from the studio, open and visible online. Mechanisms of the online public space of the web are explored in the studio. Oftentimes it's distributed, so what that means is browser-based viewing is essential to the studio, whether that's online exhibition or reaching new audiences through social platforms. Uploading and downloading is at the center of this practice. Uh, also, it's highly virtual. So whether an artist is making VR works, exhibiting in virtual exhibition spaces, or in some cases, the artists themselves are virtual, as in the case of an artist I work with, La Turbo Avidon, who is an avatar and an artist. She herself is a virtual identity, and she works in a virtual studio. You can have a visit there. It's called Club Rothko, a very interesting space. Um, some of the tools and techniques that these artists are using, um, foundational tools for the studio are software, things like Autodesk, Maya, Adobe Suite, Unity, Unreal, Cinema 4D, and Blender. At the same time that artists are embracing these tools, they're also subverting the systems of power that emerge, that these softwares emerge from often using the commercial software to expose the underlying assumptions that they're built on and imagining futures with different technological capabilities and ends. There's also continuous learning happening in these studios. So it's often a tutorial driven practice. As software updates, skills also have to be updated. They're continuously self-teaching. And in some cases, they're even building softwares themselves. So I see a really integrated relationship with the development of the tools and the development of the practice and the work itself. We saw that in the earlier panel as we had artists sitting and speaking to museum folks about the separation between the tools that they're building and the work itself. Um, also, the work is highly iterative. So as series develop over time, um, there's open critique and iterative exhibition. Oftentimes, we talk about releases of the work when we're speaking about this practice. Um, and there is a, a sort of treatment of versioning versus additioning, which I'll talk a little bit more about when I get into the specific examples. First, some resistance and challenges, um, scarcity. It remains the status quo within the art world. That shouldn't surprise anyone in the room here. Often when an artist is commercially successful, their work will disappear from the internet. I find that really unfortunate. Um, there are some artists who are pushing on that in interesting ways. Raphael Rosendahl's website contract is one that you might be familiar with. Um, so what Raphael did is he looked at the fundamental unit of ownership online, which is domain name registry, and he ties his artworks to a domain name and then makes it the collector's responsibility to steward that work and make it publicly accessible online. So I think it's interesting models like this pushing back against that scarcity and helping us rethink that within the context of the web. Um, obviously obsolescence, we've talked a lot about that. We saw all sorts of scary charts and graphs and lots of numbers around that. Um, and even the knowledge itself um, slipping through our fingers. Uh, with VR specifically, you know, the rate of change for hardware is a new device maybe every 8 to 24 months. And with each new release, new capabilities and challenges come up. Artists working with these technologies often are required to upgrade or perform their works alongside these changes. Preservation, another huge issue. We see artists more and more working with 4K, um, you know, resource intensive renders, having archive based studio practices, uh, which consist of a lot of data. Um, and then we start to see decades of studio work coming together on carriers. Um, this is what Ben Fino Radin of Small Data Industry sometimes calls the hard drives in a box problem. I think we're all familiar with this. Um, and I think that preservation and collection are actually two sides of the same coin. Um, so the reality is that the diligence needed to properly assess and handle these works is not done until the time of purchase when revenue and resources can really be poured back into the work. And I want to just say a few words about the market at this point. Um, as art and art market history show over and over again, the true avant-garde movements earn that title precisely because revolutionary concepts repeal patrons who are content to simply keep buying and selling the status quo. And we definitely see a sizable avant-garde with decades of significant immaterial artwork still on the outskirts of the market. I think this is important when talking about preservation for living artists. It situates my work with artists in the life cycle of an artwork 
I'm trying to, with transfer, create meaning around variability and change in the context of the art market so that these types of challenging artworks can find a home and the support they need for ongoing care. The market obviously encourages scarcity by supporting object-based work. We see this in institutional shows. For example, um, currently there's a show at the MCA Chicago called I Was Raised on the Internet. Objects are prioritized over media. Again and again we see this. So what I'm doing is trying to work uh, and create new structures in which media works can thrive as media and connect to new patrons. Uh, so I'm going to run through some of the procedural work that I do in the gallery, talk about versioning versus additioning, a uh, little bit of iterative release cycles, give you a glimpse at kind of how that works, and then wrap up with some of the community building techniques that I'm using to further the understanding and preservation of these works. So first to talk about some iterative series and exhibitions. Um, this is a work from an artist, Angela Washko, The Game, The Game. It's a video game presenting the practices of several prominent seduction coaches, AKA pickup artists, through the format of a dating simulator. It's a text-based game, which is the product of several years of research by Angela Washko in the pickup artist community. This was a huge project that took multiple collaborators. There was a, sh a soundtrack by the band Juju um, and programming support, hundreds of pages of text for the narrative. And so when we started to think about an exhibition of this work, we decided to put a box around a little piece of that and get it out in the world. So we launched the first chapter, you see it here, installed in Transfer Gallery. Um, and we got great audience feedback. We were able to um, test some formats for exhibition. And it really helped the artist shape the direction of the game. Um, open access is incredibly important to this artist. And so we work together to develop how the work exists as an installation. Here you see it in its most recent format um, within the museum context at the Museum of the Moving Image and how that relates to the um, more openly accessible version of the game. Uh, next is an example from an artist, Moor Shanala Hari. This is her series, She Who Sees the Unknown. Using 3D scanners and 3D printers as her tools of investigation, Morishan is re researching dark goddesses, monstrous and jinn female figures of Middle Eastern origin. She explores the symbolic meaning behind tradition and myth and speculates on the effects of colonialism and other forms of contemporary oppression. So when I started to work with Morishan, she knew she wanted to develop this into a series of 12 figures, uh, but there was only one, Huma. And we decided to dig in and create an exhibition around Huma. Um, and as you see here in Transfer Gallery, I um, turned my gallery into a cave and painted the walls and ceiling black. It was a lot of overhead, but it was what Huma needed to be conjured into the world. We also activated the gallery, you can't see it, it's off, off the shot, uh, with a reading room where Morrison could continue her research, take visits with curators and scholars, and host readings and events. So thinking about how this could become a living space to support the work. She then continued to develop the series in a way that um, helped her sustain this research-based practice, six months to a year in between figures. Here you see the second figure in the series, Yajuj Majuj, which was released with the um, Photographer's Gallery in London as a commission. It was a performative video piece. And the second piece was released actually as a performance. Um, I'm sorry, the third piece in the series, uh, Aisha Kandisha at the Rubin Museum recently. And in that, um, in that performance, Morrison's body then entered back into the narrative. And the most recent figure, the fourth figure, is called The Laughing Snake. It was just released as a, a Whitney Artport commission from the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, again, the, the narratives have become more personal. She's performing through new forms of media now. This web-based piece, I encourage you all to visit it online um, when you have some time. And make sure you have good audio when you listen to that. Um, one last example in, in this section is um, The Ways of Something. So this is an online public work, which is authored by 113 artists and compiled by Lorna Mills. So for this work, Lorna invited a huge group of artists working online to remake the iconic 1970s BBC series from John Berger titled Ways of Seeing. And it's remade in exquisite corpse style. So it changes minute by minute keeping the narrative intact, but featuring artwork from a new artist every minute. 
The result is that it turns the highbrow nature of documentary film into a wondrous and disjointed series of alternative outlooks on how artists understand art today. So again, Lorna was using an iterative style in releasing this. It's an episodic work, so that means there's four episodes. They're 30 minutes each. Here you see episode two was installed at Transfer Gallery. We had screening times two, day, uh, two times each day for gallery hours. Um, and by screening in a physical space, creating an audience and a draw before it was released online, um, let the work evolve in a way that really gained visibility and got to the point where it was sort of readied for the museum context. Here you see it um, at the Whitney Museum of Art. Um, it was installed in the Dreamlands exhibition, which was curated by Chrissy Isles, art and cinema from 1906 to 2016. So we were kind of at the end of that of that arc. Um, and artists came from all over the world to see this work installed at the Whitney. It was, it was really beautiful. Um, and since being released in this context, the work has done really well with collectors. Uh, the first edition was acquired by the Whitney. And the work is available online and also in an edition of 30 for collection. That's a reference to the episodic nature of the work, those 30 minute episodes. Um, and the series is seeing new values from collectors who are eager to pay to own an edition of this iconic work and understanding that it's also available for everyone online. That's part of the new values that we see around these types of work. Next, I want to share a little bit about uh, a new commissioning program that I launched last year in 2017 at the gallery. Um, the VR commission was founded to support artists who are already working in VR. I noticed a lot of my artists had been creating these fabulous works, but there wasn't much opportunity to show them, specifically within the context of the white cube. So the VR commission is focused on exhibition making around the VR work by extending the work beyond the headset back into the shared space of the gallery in order to spark critical dialogue of the medium as it emerges. This is the first example of the VR commission, a piece called Border Crossing Beta was 1.0, 2.0, and now you see it here installed as 3.0. I think it's kind of poetic the way that beta is included in the title of the work. Um, but it's an experimental documentary from an artist, Alfredo Salazar Caro, that simulates the experience of an immigrant crossing the US-Mexico border via the Arizona desert. The experience is based on a series of ongoing interviews with migrant workers. Once inside, the visitor roams indefinitely through the desert and may or may not find any fragments of these interviews and experiences. So for this commission, um, it's sort of a one-to-one -one installation. So when you step inside the physical installation, when you enter into the headset, you're actually in the same space, in the virtual space. Um, and this is sort of a staging or a preparation for that sense of embodiment. And likewise, when you're inside the experience, you kind of into it, your concrete literally, in this case, concrete surroundings. When inside the piece, you have the smell of the sand and the mortar in between these concrete blocks. You also can see some of the light effects through the corner of the headset. That was our sort of first exploration. As the commission continued, uh, I did a piece with Rosa Menkman. This was installed in Transfer Gallery. And in DCT siphoning, Menkman leads us through a universe of abstract simulated environments. You're actually seeing the world as a DCT block, which for all intents and purposes you can think of as a pixel, but you're a piece of a computer code. Um, and the narrative evolves from early raster graphics to our contemporary state of CGI realism. At each level, the virtual world interferes with the formal properties of VR, creating stunning and disorienting environments, throwing into question our preconceived notions of virtual reality. So when I started to talk about this exhibition with Rosa, um, she was really concerned with the kind of equipment fetishism and spectacle around a headset in a gallery. Oftentimes when someone goes into the VR, they then become um, the, the thing that's being photographed and, and you know, Instagrammed. <laughs> they become a little bit of spectacle. So we wanted to create a safe space for the virtualized experience, something that was a bit more private. That was a huge driving factor here. But also we wanted to create an exhibition where you could fully experience the piece, the formal qualities of the piece, the conceptual basis of the piece without ever going into VR. So People came into the gallery and didn't even realize, actually you have to walk around this figure in the back to get to the VR headset. So we really designed that immersive installation um, 
to have that effect. One more example from the VR Commission. This is a work from Claudia Hart. The Flower Matrix proposes a new kind of liminal space where mixed reality architecture becomes fantastical, embellished by decorative elements. You see here ceramics, wallpaper, floor covering, um, embracing an aesthetic of the fake in which technology has replaced nature, sugary sweet and chemically toxic in equal measures. When you enter this chamber, it's quite disorienting. In this case, you descend down some stairs. Um, and every surface here is augmented reality. So immediately you have a little bit of a social experience with AR as you come with the iPad, you're starting to look around, you get glimpses at the um, augments which you're about to see when you enter into the VR headset. But what we really used this exhibition to do was to release a beta product and test and iterate and learn during the course of the exhibition. So we hosted tea parties, in the flower matrix chamber. We invited 10 to 12 people to come have critique, see the work. There's no lines when there's only 10 people. We're all socializing, we're talking to each other, so there's not that awkward waiting. Um, and in the course of this exhibition, it was about two months, we made nine different releases of the piece. We were stress testing the piece. We encountered bugs. We encountered crashes when there were large audiences coming through. We also refined some of the effects, the gravity, the motion. People were getting a little nauseous with the initial way of navigating the space, so tweaking everything in response in real time as the exhibition was open, um, opening ourselves up to failure. The art world's quite allergic to failure, but putting that out there and using the exhibition space as a chance to fail and learn uh, was really rewarding, and we got to a place at the end of those two months where we have a fully vetted, really robust artwork that we can then addition and place with collectors. Uh, which brings me to the transfer download. Um, this is an experimental traveling exhibition format that I have been developing for the past few years. This is the most recent version of the download, which was commissioned by an institution dedicated to collecting and preserving media art called the Toma Foundation. This is in their Santa Fe space. They also have a location in Chicago. So what is the download? It's a large format installation that presents a survey of media, such as augmented um, Real, sorry, augmented and virtual reality, animated GIFs, algorithmic works, and net art. It's a download of the ways that contemporary studios are working with media. So the idea initially was to create a new format for a virtualized group show as a way to exhibit a variety of media formats in one physical space. But through iteration and exhibition, the download has become something much more than that. It's evolved into a rapidly expanding catalog of variable media art that's now adapting to all kinds of contexts. You see an institutional commission here. I've also taken it into art market activations, shown it at an art fair. Um, this was the original installation of the transfer download. It was conceived at the Minnesota Street Project in San Francisco, which is a really cool gallery community experimenting with resource sharing and access. And I developed it in partnership with a collaborator and a super talented young interdisciplinary artist and lead hacker named Harvey Moon. From San Francisco, it then traveled to New York City, where it was seen by a curator, and then traveled further to Basel in Switzerland and Shanghai as part of an exhibition called Unreal, the Algorithmic Present. And it is very simple in format, and I believe that's what makes it both powerful and portable. So how it works, I prompt an artist to create an instantiation of their work to fit the three-channel format. I ask them to think of it as a virtual solo installation. The three-channel presentation of these works you see installed is considered an iteration. Many of the works exist prior to their installation in the download. Each work is available for acquisition, though their formats range. So just gonna show you some examples of those different formats. Here we have a three-channel work. It natively was a three-channel work back from 2010, adapts perfectly into the download, but you see it here as it might be installed in a collector's home. Next, next example is a web-based work. It's a tiny algorithm from Daniel Temkin called the Stripe Modulator. It's an open public work on the web, um, can also be installed as a single channel video. Uh, next, uh, the artist Laturbo Abidon that I mentioned earlier, she has this fabulous single channel work called ID. And what she did is extend the narrative onto two additional channels for the download. Likewise, you see a 4K work here. It's a diptych installed in a, a portrait orientation. Again, completely adapted for the download. 
starting to get the picture. And again, the work from Rosa Menkman, the VR adapts really nicely into the three channel because it kind of surrounds your field of vision. Um, so DCT siphoning was also shown in early downloads. Um, but if you collect the work, it's actually available as a virtual reality application. So each new iteration of the download responds to its location and context, meaning no two downloads are the same. To achieve a sense of embodiment, the scale and screen placement respond directly to the architecture in the space. I seek to integrate and disappear this into the architecture. Sometimes it's square, as you saw earlier. Sometimes it's more open, like this the, uh, presented at the Nada Art Fair. It stretched 48 feet long on a mezzanine that was kind of above the fair, and it opened up facing the massive grid of booths below. From a curatorial perspective, the work selected change the exhibition quite a lot. At this point, I've exhibited 25 works in this format, and the catalog is growing with each installation. Uh, here you see a quote from uh, some great press coverage that came out of that art fair exhibition. So placing this in market context has really expanded my thinking about how more visibility can be brought to this significant movement in contemporary art. Which brings me to the current last thing I want to share with you today. So in 2018, I have stepped into the role of director for this museum. It's a 501c3 nonprofit collecting institution. It was founded in 2016, itself has gone through some iterations. And I really see the current as an opportunity to start to shape an institutional model around the values that I've been exploring in my work at Transfer. So this is what the current is all about, collecting things that other institutions can't or aren't interested in supporting or maybe just aren't quite there yet. That's our bread and butter. That's what we really love um, to think about. And we're doing this in partnership with Small Data Industries. So we're leading with conservation as a value and building all our processes around that. It's a very artist-focused acquisition process, and it requires a new degree of attention, malleability, and obviously these works we're dealing with require a deeper level of care. So at the core of our model is the idea that we're creating these intimate salon happenings where the work is installed in a home-like setting. Our members are invited to spend time with the works, get to know the artists, and engage in dialogue about the issues present in the works. We organize acquisitions around topics which are central to technology's impact on the human condition. This is the first salon we hosted earlier this year on the topic of identity. And you get a sense of the viewing experience. It's very chill. You're in a home. Here you see one of our committee members in a hammock enjoying this lovely piece from Jacoby Satterwhite, VR. Here you see the founder of the museum, William Nathan, himself a startup founder and venture capitalist, enjoying the Hyphen Lab's neurospeculative Afrofeminism VR work in Oculus Rift. In our first salon, we had this lovely iOS application installed in the bedroom. So it was a very intimate experience. You could go play in there. Um, this is our second salon, the current permanence. Um, it was curated by Ben Fina Radin. So we're also dealing with curators who have different perspectives and are interdisciplinary in their roles. We switch curators every salon. So we really believe in bringing fresh perspectives and new ideas to the table when it comes to selecting and installing works. Uh, this is a picture of uh, it will never be the same .com, which I'm very happy to say entered into the collection and everyone can see it. It's the Raphael Rosendahl website contract I mentioned earlier governs that piece. Um, so members, how this works is that the salon is for our committee members and what we're doing is we're lowering the barrier to entry for getting involved with actually shaping cultural legacy. So it's $250 per salon or about a thousand US dollars a year. Um, to be a member of The Current, which is equivalent to most young patrons groups, which are usually focused only on social engagements, um, activities, parties. Instead, at The Current, you're actually helping us build a collection and helping us shape cultural legacy. Moreover, we're experimenting with access and asking what it means for our members to live with the museum's collection. So what if instead of going to the museum, it came to you? And we're taking care to work within the system. We're not talking about mass distribution here. Um, we're aligning ourselves with like-minded galleries, artists, and agents, and building networks of trust with our members as we build this new form of access. 
Our goals for the future are to establish collection committees um, in new locations all over the world. The idea here is not to import New York culture and New York perspective into another place, but to go into a, a new location, work with a curator local to that region, really build a community there, and curate shows uh, that are relevant to the interests and the topics in those locations. Um, we're also looking at thinking about engaging companies and startups as the source of our acquisitions budget and how we can also think about licensing and distribution our, collecting, our collection and paying back living artists. These are some ideas for the future. And hopefully what we're doing is growing a new model of stewardship for contemporary media art. That's it. Thank you so much. So I'll invite Kalani up to the, the seat here and I'm about to sit down with her there. Um, so quite a lot of content there. <laughs> um, start thinking about your questions. I'll, I might just get started on one or two. Um, I have to say, as someone working in an institution, that kind of blows my mind. <laughs> I mean, where do we start with all our policies and procedures around this? So I'm going to start with a really basic, basic question. I guess um, with your gallery space, um, coming down to just the basic um, equipment needed to show such a variety oh, yeah. of works, how do you manage that? <laughs> my storage is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> I'm constantly moving around giant TVs and building huge screens. Um, so yeah, that kind of variability and changes is a real intense, real world kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we think of immaterial art and that it might be easy to transport, but it is so labor intensive. It's mm -hmm. It's really quite wild. Um, but I oftentimes rely on resources or connections from artists within the community of practice that I'm supporting at Transfer. Mm -hmm. So collectively, we have all kinds of nerdy equipment that we can bring together to realize really cool installations. I've also been very successful in um, getting support from equipment providers who are interested in new applications for their projectors, let's say, really nice, like 40K lumen projectors, things like that. So, so you are, you're, uh, you're acquiring or, or collecting the equipment and, and holding that as well? Um, in some cases, I'm loaning. Okay. And yeah. uh, in a lot of cases, though, I am. Like, I, I love Samsung TVs, so I will scour Craigslist to yeah. find, like, all these five of the same TVs if I'm doing a large installation, for example. So it's a mix. Getting my hands on as much as I can, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I guess uh, with transfer, I'm kind of interested. Um, how, how, how are you finding working with artists to know that their artworks are being, I guess, transferred and displayed in so many iterations and forms? Have you, um, I mean, you talked about trying to develop these communities of trust, but there must be such an incredible <laughs> relationship with some of these artists knowing that there'll be um, different formats. Um, a number of the artists, I think, you know, as we're working with, um, we've worked with can be quite particular about how th you know the sound levels uh, visuals mm -hmm. and what sort of formats things are presented how, how are you working through I guess those discussions and how are they kept in the loop as these um, works are being shown in so many sort of variations mm -hmm. that's a great question um, some artists are definitely more particular than others for example things like color temperature and yes yeah, sound quality sound presentation um, are really crucial for some works others are more adaptable so in general if someone's more open with their practice and already putting a lot online they understand the fluidity mm -hmm. in which their works will be appearing um, i can speak to specifically at the current what we're doing is we're not really being prescriptive you did see the sort of shot of the usb and our first round of acquisitions was distributed on a usb but we're not being prescriptive with the way it's not always a promise like this will always be a single channel thing that we're displaying mm. instead what we do is we build the expectation that whatever the artist desires to have that kind of private exhibition copy whatever that format is we let them drive that and our members have that expectation so it's different every time and we expect that in the future there will be someone who you know is is maybe more averse if it's more of an installation work or has or a, let's say a sound piece right and would require specific equipment we're open to the to the idea that that might not be something that we can share kind of so easily um, in our in our more recent round of acquisitions it's going to be interesting to see what happens um, one of the things we acquired is a um, 3d printed sculpture and it itself is actually a dead drop, so it contains data which is then meant to be publicly accessible for anyone to come and copy. Um, so it in itself already 
replicates itself. Um, so it'll be really interesting to hear what comes out of that artist interview, for example, to see how we share that. Yeah. Um, were there any questions? We'll start with questions because I'm sure there's. Yep. Uh, thank you. That was super. The, lots of information, um, but a great <laughs> presentation. I'm keen to know more about the. Do the. Do your members have a, or is there a particular uh, age demographic that your membership currently is or is it quite diverse? And my, the second part to that is do you feel like your members are coming from a traditional art collecting background where owning a thing, an object, a work is the important part or are they interested in giving the institution money to, for artists to make more work? Uh, great question. Yeah, the current membership is has been surprising to us. Um, the founder also works in technology, and so hy our hypothesis was around how can we get individuals with um, technology wealth engaged in the art world, and we wanted to create a comfortable space for them to come enter into a dialogue about works. We find our membership is actually half and half, so more on the art world side than we expected. So in our last salon, we had um, curators from major museums, um, conservators who were part of the conversation, thanks to Ben's invitation, jumping on board to support this institution and this kind of experimentation. We also have artists who are members, so artists wanting to support other artists um, and building values around that. Um, we have some gallerists, we have some leading collectors who are also part of the committee. And then on the other side, we have young professionals. They're in finance, they're in law, they're tech founders, there are um, other kinds of startup founders and venture capitalists. So it's a nice mix. Um, Age-wise, it totally varies, too. Like, I think our oldest committee member is probably in their 70s, and the youngest probably late 20s. Yeah. Just walking up towards the, the back there. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, quite interested in what you have to say about the archiving of the collections that you keep in terms of the different iterations and specifically about 3D modeling and printing and um, how you conceptualize the object and the blueprint and which is which and um, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that definitely depends on a case by case basis how the artist is interested in treating that. Um, I can say from the current's perspective, and that's why I'm so excited to be a part of this institution, again, our entire activity is related to this kind of archiving and conservation. We're building in partnership with Small Data a new kind of way of storing that as well. Um, so really pushing forward into thinking about these resources serving a larger community. Um, I can say on the gallery side, it's a, a bad news not so good on that side and I you know I think that myself as a technology minded person I'm probably ahead of most gallerists um, and that's pretty bleak so artists are maintaining their own archives within the studio and there are huge needs around more support in that regard I don't know that that's ever going to really be a gallery's role it would be great if it was but the money and resources that it requires um, it comes more from private capital or again from a museum uh, a collection with a long view. Um, so a lot of these, a lot of these platforms, like the transfer download, for example, that is some of the most secure work that I handle. That that's backed up. We have um, copies and documentation. We have cataloging around all of that. So formats like that, which again, that's a market facing sort of activity, which is why it has so much financial support and power behind it. Um, but with all of these different iterations, it really is kind of in the hands of the studio still. Can I just, we spoke uh, previously about that idea of, uh, I guess, different uh, communities of art making have different approaches or, or even um, uh, themes in terms of the way they preserve. I mean, we talked about how VR artists and the, the systems in which they work are slightly different than, let's say, GIF artists mm -hmm. and, and how that within those systems already kind of um, help inform their concepts of preservation or what they might offer you in terms of those ideas of preservation. Mm -hmm. Did you want to expand, I guess, a little bit maybe um, on kind of the different approaches that some of those, I guess, different artists that you work with or, or different yeah. communities? Yeah. 
Um, so I would say that I think you kind of nailed it when you when you talk about the difference between like an artist working in VR and render intensive mm -hmm. studio practice versus an artist working with appropriated animated GIF like content like Lorna Mills. Um, I think she almost fully relies on the cloud. I think she has one or two um, primary storage devices, but then we look at a practice like Alex McLeod or Daniel Temkin, where we're talking, you know, they deal with intense raid backups. Um, Alex McLeod has a whole render farm that he maintains in his studio, uh, along with a triple redundancy backup system. So it sometimes maps to the, I think, um, the sentiment and the mentality within the studio, what the actual technology infrastructure and wherewithal and resilience that the studio will have. Mm -hmm. And are there any more questions? There's one more, and I think that's the last one because we're out of <laughs> zero. <laughs> yeah. Yep, down to zero. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering, because you work so closely with the artists in acquisitions, whether you have a sort of formalized handover documentation of the artist's wishes that sort of goes along with the acquisitions? Yep. Um, so I can speak on two different fronts in that regard. So on the gallery side, um, when a, a work is sold, we have um, documentation that's produced. So oftentimes that includes like um, uh, acceptable exhibition formats, um, any copyright statements, uh, the rights for the collector to, to display privately versus publicly. So that there is um, a lot of documentation that goes together at the time of the sale and packaging that up. Um, from the current's perspective, um, our acquisition process is being largely driven by small data industries. Um, and it's very cool for me to see kind of what happens on the other side of the fence from the institutional perspective there. Uh, we're again developing some new documentation. So we have a, a purchase agreement that states also this idea of the private exhibition copy and our rights around that. Um, we also have developed a contract for our members to whom we're giving this kind of access. And it's a document that they sign that states they understand um, they don't own the work, the museum wholly owns owns the work, they don't have rights to trade or sell it, they can't distribute it, they can't exhibit publicly. So we are building some um, new forms of agreements around those types of things. Um, and the acquisitions process is really driven, again, by the artist interview and the conservation treatment. Um, that's, that's kind of upfront in our process and um, fuels everything else. So. And at the end of the process, uh, which we're still kind of getting in place, is this super cool new system that Small Data Industries is building for us for storage. Fantastic. So say so thank you to Kalani for... Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you.